Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our first webinar of Families USA Center on Health Equity Action for System Transformation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, today we will, you will be hearing from two staff of Families USA. I am Cynthia Hernandez Cancio, and I'm the Director of Families USA Center on Health Equity Action for System Transformation. And I am Denise Sanchez. I'm a Policy Analyst at Families USA. And we will be your presenters today. Um, so let's do a quick overview of what we'll be covering during this webinar. We're going to be talking about a couple of new developments at Families USA. Um, the Center on Health Equity Action for System Transformation, our Evidence for Equity Initiative, which is one of its projects, and of course it will have time for questions and answers at the end. So let's start with the Center. Late last year we launched the Center on Health Equity Action for System Transformation to catalyze and support coordinated action to advance health system transformation policies that are focused on reducing racial, ethnic, and geographic health inequities by elevating the voices and priorities of the most affected communities. Our key objectives with this center are, number one, we need to build a movement and catalyze and coordinate action um, to advance health equity focus system transformation. We need to channel and translate the power of the most innovative thinking from across the country into very actionable uh, strategies and recommendations for advocates, policy experts, uh, uh, decision makers, and other leaders. And finally, for us it's very important and central to our mission to make sure that while we're doing this, we are working with the leaders who represent the communities of color and the other underserved groups um, to enhance their capacity so that they can actually be part of the decision-making processes. And for that, we, we plan on providing uh, a variety of strategic guidance, uh, uh, technical assistance, and tools. So the, our plan for the center right now is that it's now housing uh, a number of uh, initiatives that existed prior to the center, as well as some new ones. So the Health Equity Task Force for Delivering Payment Transformation um, has been, we've been developing it for the last couple of years, um, and, now it, and uh, now it is part of the, the center. In addition to that, um, about three years ago, we started a Community Health Worker Sustainability Collaborative. Um, that is now also part of the work of the center. Uh, we launched just in December an Evidence for Equity initiative, which Denise is going to be talking about a little bit more shortly. As always, we are always going to be uh, continuing to provide strategic guidance and technical assistance um, to advocates across the country at the local, state, and national level. And we're also going to be launching a Health Equity Action for Transformation Network um, to try to get more people involved in this work. And so the question is why? Why is it that right now we are focusing so much of our energy and attention on addressing health equity through, through system transformation? And first of all, the, one of the reasons is because equity is one of the pillars of Families USA's mission, along with coverage, um, system transformation, and uh, consumer engagement. But there, is also, there are also other reasons why there's a strong need to grapple with equity in healthcare right away. And that is because health system transformation will only succeed if it solves for health equity. Um, first of all, there's the issue of addressing how expensive and wasteful health inequities are in terms of human potential, or what some might call the moral cost, but also in terms of the economic cost uh, for, for this country if we don't address these issues. This is data from the, from the Kellogg Foundation on, on exactly an estimate on how much uh, our, our economy is actually losing because of the persistence of, these, of racial inequities. In addition to that, there is a strong demographic imperative to fix them quickly, and that is because of how quickly our population is changing in the United States. Today, the majority of kids under 10 are kids of color, and by next year, the estimate is that all children under 18 will be kids of color. And in just one generation, 
our whole country will be uh, from communities of color. And so it is really, it behooves us to make sure that this future workforce, um, the kids that are in school right now, are able to be healthy and thrive so that they can contribute um, to our shared prosperity in the future. But so right now, historically, we are in a very um, critical point in the history of system transformation and equity, where we're facing um, these divergent paths for health system transformation. On the one hand, you know, there is huge opportunity uh, to leverage health system transformation as we define what is valuable, you know, what, what are the kinds of treatments and care and delivery models that are valuable and effective. Um, but it also could be a huge risk because if we don't take into consideration these, these um, inequities and these challenges, what we're going to end up with is making inequities actually worse. So on the one hand, the first path, if you take a rising tide lifts all boats approach and we reform our healthcare system thinking only of some fictional average patient um, and you assume that the financial incentives that are being created will eventually force providers to figure out how to do a better job with diverse patients and then not even worry about how the distribution of better outcomes um, plays out in different communities, what's going to happen is that uh, many communities, including communities of color, rural communities, and others are going to be left behind. The alternative is to take a targeted universalism path, which is being very clear about the universal goal of making sure that everyone has access to the highest quality, um, culturally centered, effective, and affordable health care they can get. Um, and, but it would have to focus deliberately on narrowing these inequities. Uh, and it's, that's a lot like the idea of universal design, right? If you set up uh, systems that are easy for, let's say, people in wheelchairs or people um, who have other disabilities to navigate, then it's likely going to be pretty easy to navigate for everyone. But unfortunately, right now, we're going on the wrong path. We've been on the wrong path for a while. As we implement payment reforms, there, we have been able to document that there are negative consequences for people of color, rural communities, and other vulnerable communities based on these new payment models. And one of the main reasons for this is that it's very basic, and it's that what's happening in terms of transformation is being done without the input or even the consideration of communities that are hit hardest by inequities. And so what we wanted to do, so what, you, what we have are system reform policy leaders who aren't thinking about, inequ about equity. You have some really interesting progress made in kind of the academic and in certain healthcare systems um, where we see some progress, but it's not being translated more broadly into policy development and advocacy. And then you have the health equity um, community and community of color leaders who are, just have not been so far very engaged in system reform. And so what we're trying to do with the center is solve for that by creating a, a structure and institution where these uh, communities and these experts can come together and we can actually uh, achieve better results. Our work so far um, has included, as you know, as I mentioned, we've been working on some parts of this work for a few years, like our community health worker work and our task force. Um, but I think the most, one of the key uh, resources that I wanted to point out for folks today um, was our framework for advancing health equity and value, which was published last summer. Um, we needed to do, we realized that we needed to create a framework for thinking through and organizing how this work had to be done and that nobody had ever attempted to do this from a policy advocacy perspective. So we had to start with developing a policy framework. We developed examples and options for addressing the many domains of needed action. But we also realized that guidance was sorely needed on how to effectively include leaders of color, um, leaders of color in these processes. And part of what we wanted to do was create um, kind of a blueprint to show very concretely all the different um, angles to addressing uh, inequity through system transformation. And that included 86 specific recommendations under six domains. Then um, late last year, we, we realized, you know, we, were, we realized that 86 is a lot for people to handle and that we really needed to make an effort of working with our task force, again, some of the top thinkers across the country on these issues 
to prioritize where we believe uh, advocates, whether you're an advocate in, um, whether you're a researcher or you're an advocate at the state level, federal level, you know, whatever, um, where we think would be the best places to start. And we started with, and that's how we came up with 19 for 2019. 19 recommendations, because um, we wanted to make sure that we had, you know, between two and four recommendations for each of the domains. And of these, 17 are actionable at the state level. Many are actionable at the state and the federal level. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we were, we, we were thinking about federal, state, as well as some, um, you know, more local and private sector change that would be needed. So how did we get to the six domains that I mentioned? Well, first of all, we knew that, you know, the, the, the center of health system transformation work is figuring out how to rejigger payment systems. So we knew that our goal was building payment systems that sustain and reward high-quality, equitable health care. But then we realized that we lacked some of the building blocks to be able to do this. To start with, those payment systems are often based on um, measurement. And there was a dire need for having more equity-focused measurement that accelerates reductions in health inequities that can then power some of these payment systems so that they're actually rewarding what works. But then we also realized that to, in order to have evidence-based measurements, you need to have an evidence base that is transparent and representative. And, and Denise will be talking a little bit more today about what is the issue in, with this uh, particular domain and some strategies for addressing it. And now, once you have this, uh, you know, kind of this foundation, you need to be able to implement it. And for that, we realize that we need, first of all, to have a healthcare workforce that can actually drive equity and value. And by that, we don't just mean doctors and nurses, but more broadly, all up and down um, the, the job descriptions in the healthcare system. We need to make sure that we're investing to support the safety net and small community providers so that they can continue to function in a, a health system transformation alternative payment model world, um, which can be very challenging for several historical reasons. And we want to make sure, at, but at the same time, there, there are uh, entities that for many years have been providing care to the underserved, very, in, in many cases, very culturally competent culturally centered care that people trust. So we want to make sure that we are not, um, that these systems, these new payment systems don't just, um, you know, put them out of business. And then finally, um, given what many of you probably know about how uh, important socially determined factors are in achieving, in addressing better health outcomes, we knew that it was very important that we not only have more links with community partnerships that are trusted in the community to provide complementary and, and enabling services, but that it's also important that they're well resourced. And so that's how we came up with um, these six domains uh, for what's required in terms of policy change to achieve health equity. Um, I see that there is a hand raised. Is there a, can you, uh, we would need for you to type in the question is my understanding. Okay, I apologize, we'll get back to you. Um, we need, we're figuring out how to make this work. Okay, so. Um, now, with that, I will leave you with Denise Sanchez, who is going to be talking more specifically about our Evidence for Equity initiative. Hi, everyone. Um, so to, be, to continue, um, since you mentioned that one of the building blocks to achieving a high-value, equitable healthcare system is representative and transparent evidence. The center created the Evidence for Equity initiative to focus on promoting the need for representative and transparent evidence to help decision makers implement health system transformation policies that advance health equity instead of making inequities worse. This part of the presentation will focus on, um, on why evidence is so important to health system transformation and the need for the initiative. 
To begin with, here's an overview of what I'll be discussing the next 20 minutes or so. I will illustrate the underlying limitations with the current evidence base. I will define three research methods used to generate evidence. And then I'll discuss how two of these methods, comparative effectiveness research, or CER, and patient-centered outcomes research, PCOR, are potential solutions to strengthen the evidence base. All right, so to the problem. We know that the overall quality and efficiency of healthcare system depends on whether it can evolve into one that eliminates health inequities and can provide excellent and equitable care for all. To do this, transformation efforts are relying on evidence and are increasingly rewarding treatments with strong evidence of success and value. But there are a number of underlying issues with the evidence base that we have now that present challenges for health system transformation efforts to adequately achieve their intended results of high value, high quality care. Firstly, according to the Institute of Medicine, most treatment uh, provided in the U.S. are not well supported by evidence. This means that patients are receiving care that has not undergone rigorous scientific evaluation. Secondly, the evidence used to treat consumers, plan and implement interventions, and deliver care is not represented, re representative. Health system and clinical research has excluded not only communities of color, but also women, the elderly, children, those with disabilities, and those with medical complexities. The reasons for this, specifically as it pertains to communities of color, will be explained later. And so these facts raise a couple of questions. Can healthcare system transformation solve for equity if the evidence it relies on is neither representative nor transparent? Are we reinforcing inequities by building a system based on incomplete and biased data? So let us take a few steps back to understand how and why this is. Most medical research has studied the average effectiveness and safety of individual medications, medical devices, and treatment. Few studies have compared the effectiveness of different options. Re uh, number two. Research subjects have mostly been young white males, but results are generally assumed to apply to everyone, defaulting into a one-size-fits-all approach. This means that large chunks of the population have not been considered and the impact of this inclusion has had detrimental health outcomes, as I will share later on. Number three, further, when diverse populations have been included, research, researchers don't always disaggregate findings by demographics that would allow for in-depth analysis. I will discuss the significance of disaggregated data in more detail in the next slide. And then lastly, clinical and health system research has primarily focused on outcomes driven by what researchers, clinicians, and payers want to know, and rarely on what matters most to people. I will be explaining the importance of patient perspectives in research in the next section. And so to the significance of subgroup analysis, disaggregating data is critical to understanding the variations across and tailored treatments and interventions that can better address inequities. Even when race and ethnicity data are available, they are often collected, analyzed, and reported in aggregated groups that hide clinically important differences among subgroups of larger categories, such as Asian Americans and Latinos. Some groups, like Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiians, American Indians, and Alaska Natives, are missing altogether. The absence of subgroups and analysis in data means researchers cannot examine important racial and ethnic variations, making the data less relevant and useful. For example, only by separating the data on Puerto Ricans from those of other Latino populations was it possible to identify serious inequities in asthma prevalence, outcomes, mortality, and albuterol response. Looking at Latino data overall obscured these critical inequities. Current asthma prevalence rates from the CDC demonstrate these differences across groups and within. Hispanics, as you can see, Hispanics overall are less likely to have asthma, Mexicans even less so, but Puerto Ricans are the most affected of any racial and ethnic group. The merging of all these factors has created an incomplete and sometimes biased evidence base with real health consequences. Unsurprisingly, those disproportionately shouldering health inequities are those that have been largely excluded from the research. Healthcare systems and reform depend on scientifically rooted evidence to make decisions about how to best treat patients. So why have some communities been underrepresented in research? A number of barriers contribute to the low participation of communities of colors in research. This is not an exhaustive list, but it includes a long-standing mistrust resulting from a long history of gross 
unethical research practices. One infamous example of this is the Tuskegee syphilis study, a clinical study that lasted over 40 years, but was only meant to last six months, and included 600 of African American men, and that sought to study the natural progression of the disease. Researchers claimed they were treating bad blood, a local term to describe several ailments, including syphilis, anemia, and fatigue. But in reality, the men received no treatment and had not been properly informed about the real purpose of the study. Another reason is the lack of researchers of color. Researchers of color are more likely to investigate issues among these communities and may be able to bridge issues of mistrust, but less likely to receive funding to undertake their projects. For example, white investigators are twice as likely as their black peers to receive NIH research grants, even when controlling for education. Thirdly, there is inadequate researcher training to undertake studies among communities of color, which may compound existing mistrust issues. And then finally, there are financial challenges. There are insufficient incentives to recruit and retain minority participants that prevent participation. The combination of barriers to participation together with either implicit or explicit exclusion from research has created a well-known clinical research gap such that African Americans and Latinos constitute 33% of the total U.S. population, but only 6% of, of all participants in federally funded studies. Less than 5% of federally funded lung disease research has focused on people of color in the last 20 years, despite higher prevalence of lung-related diseases and mortality among African Americans. And then lastly, racial and ethnic minorities have the highest burden of cancer, but are the primary target of less than 2% of the National Center's Institutes of the National Center Institute's clinical trials. This slide illustrates the prevalence of comorbidity um, specifically across different heart disease, but people with any comor comorbid chronic conditions have been, in, have been excluded from research because of the complexities they present. At the same time, such patients account for more than 80% of Medicare costs and are overrepresented in Medicaid and private, private insurance plans, presenting not only a health need, but also an, an economic need to be included in the research. This clinical research gap has created a troubling mismatch between the available evidence and its applicability to different communities. So for example, albuterol, the first line treatment for asthma attack, is less effective among Puerto Ricans and African Americans, who along with having some of the highest asthma rates of any group, are also more likely to go to the ER for an asthma attack and more likely to die from the disease. Um, among Native Americans and Pacific Islanders, uh, three are, they are three times as likely to have coronary heart disease, but 75% of Pacific Islanders have a genetic trait that causes adverse effects from a, com from a common blood thinner used to prevent strokes and heart attacks, increasing the risk of the very condition the medication was formulated to prevent. Another example is um, the common blood thinner warfarin, which pos poses a high risk of excessive bleeding for 86% of Asian Americans. The previous examples demonstrate the critical need for representation in evidence. Continuing to generate evidence that is not representative or transparent will allow the healthcare system and any reform efforts to continue to make incorrect assumptions about what treatments works, work best for any particular person and community. Not disabusing these incorrect assumptions will only contribute to what reform efforts seek to ameliorate, widening inequities, poor health outcomes, and rising costs. Um, but there are potential solutions to addressing the underlying limitations with our current evidence. These include CER and PCOR. You may be wondering what these are, so let's begin this section with some definitions. First up is randomized clinical trials, or RCTs. These are considered the gold standard of research methods, um, and in these, participants are, dis are divided randomly into separate groups that test a treatment versus a placebo or a different treatment. Chance creates groups that are similar enough to allow for a fair comparison of results and arrive at an, to arrive at an average. Comparative effectiveness research, CER, research that compares the benefits and harms of two or more existing healthcare options to determine which works best for which patient. Patient-centered outcomes research, uh, or PCOR, research it's research that compares two or more existing healthcare options to determine which works best for which patients and under which circumstances 
based on the needs, preferences, preferences and outcomes most important to patients and those who care for them. So let's talk about CER first. This method focuses on helping patients, clinicians, policymakers, and others make evidence-based decisions that support better healthcare quality and improve individual population outcomes. We'll make CER stand out from research methods traditionally building the evidence base, <clears throat> like RCTs, is that it compares the benefits and harms of two or more existing methods to prevent, diagnose, or treat a health condition or to improve delivery, or delivery of care. RCTs, on the other hand, compare treatment to a, to a placebo that aren't necessarily effective or generalizable. Further, CER is conducted in real-world settings that are more accessible for participants, which can include, for example, community clinics. In comparison, RCTs are mainly conducted in academic settings that may present challenges to participation from those who don't live near an academic institution or don't have access to transportation. Remember, financial barriers present challenges for some communities to participate. Incentives to travel to, to these locations is one of them. CER is also intentional about its participants. CER intentionally, intentionally seeks diverse populations and subgroups or real world populations for its studies that make it by design inclusionary. RCTs, on the other hand, have highly exclusionary criteria that applies to only those who could get to the settings where these are conducted to begin with. Lastly, CER studies are designed to tease out variations in response by people with specific characteristics, making it possible to conduct subgroup analysis, the significance of which I explained earlier which allow tailored recommendations to particular groups and circumstances. In contrast, RCTs yield results in the aggregate for hypothesis testing that, as you recall, are mostly based on a singular group of participants. In this way, CER can be useful in generating the more robust and representative evidence base needed to advance health equity. And now to PCOR. As mentioned earlier, medical research has mostly examined the questions clinicians and scientists have thought important, which may not be necessarily important to patients, the individuals who will be the beneficiaries of the evidence. PCOR is different. PCOR pairs CER with patient perspectives and priorities to help people and their caregivers communicate and make informed healthcare decisions, allowing their voices to be heard in assessing the value of healthcare options. This research is driven by centered patient-centered uh, patient questions like, given my personal characteristics, conditions, and preferences, what should I expect will happen to me? What are my options, and what are the potential benefits and harms of those options? And lastly, of all available options, which is best for me? To do this, PCOR meaningfully engages patients, their families, and their caregivers in the research process from beginning to end. That means the planning, the implementation, analysis, and dissemination. In this way, PCOR values patients as stakeholders in the research process rather than just endpoints. Um, PCOR's emphasis on patient engagement and use of real-world populations and settings is an important opportunity to advance health equity um, by broadening the evidence base and making it more transparent, relevant, and actionable. PCOR opens the door to more diverse research subjects that generate priorities that are directly responsive to the needs of different communities that might hold particular values and experience a variety of challenges. Expanding the evidence base so it is more representative will help produce more effective and generalizable therapies, interventions, and strategies that work for more people. Um, additionally, meaningfully engaged patients may help improve the quality, relevance, and impact of research by challenging and countering researchers' assumptions. Engaging diverse patient populations is particularly necessary considering the relatively small number of research of colors. In addition to promoting the inclusion of more diverse populations, patient involvement can serve as a check on researcher biases that otherwise might go undetected and that might lead to inaccurate research results. Remember that an issue with current research practices is inadequate um, researcher training to design and implement studies among communities of color. PCOR's patient engagement can help address that and in doing so potentially advance health equity. As previously mentioned, the clinical research gap in evidence and its impact on health outcomes is a long and well-known fact. To close this gap, a number of government agencies have supported CER and the Affordable Care Act created an independent nonprofit to implement PCOR to generate better evidence. 
the nonprofit Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI, is directed to assist a wide variety of healthcare stakeholders in making informed healthcare decisions by advancing the quality and relevance of evidence concerning the manner in which diseases, disorders, and other health conditions can effectively and appropriately be prevented, diagnosed, treated, and managed through research and evidence synthesis that considers variations in patient subpopulations. The evidence is my own, and it recognizes the absence of certain populations, along with the need for depth, in-depth analysis that are central to strengthening the evidence and advancing health equity. Specifically, PCORI fund, funds projects that use CER research with a focus on patient priorities, uh, projects that focus on the research topics, questions, and outcomes that are most important to patients and those who care for them, like their caregivers, families, and even clinicians, um, projects that are guided by priorities developed through close partnerships with a range of healthcare stakeholders, and projects that include patients not only as subjects, but also as partners who help determine what to study and how. To date, PCORI has sponsored a variety of research projects that demonstrate how important this type of research is for underrepresented communities in healthcare settings. Among Asian Americans, one project looked at whether a mobile app tailored to hepatitis works better than one that is not to get Asian Americans to increase hepatitis B and C screening. One group of Asian American patients received a general mobile health app, and a second group received a more specific hepatitis health um, app that taught them about the virus and prepared them to ask a provider about screening. Patients using the hepatitis app were more likely to report talking to their provider about the virus and to get tested. Another project looked at the best way to ask patients about their sexual orientation and gender identity, or SOGI, in the emergency room. Hospitals typically do not ask SOGI information that can be relevant to improving the quality of care. Researchers tested two methods to collect this information, having a nurse ask the patient and having the patient fill out a form. Results, show, results showed that patients were more comfortable filling out a form than speaking with a nurse. The Evidence for Equity Initiative believes that evidence must be made to be equitably beneficial across all groups, gender, age, and disability. The evidence available to inform both clinical practice and health system reform is plagued by large gaps with real-life consequences. It, is also rarely, it also rarely measures the outcomes that are most important to patients and their families. To ensure that health system transformation does not inadvertently widen inequities, rather address and eliminate them, the evidence these efforts rely on must be representative and transparent. CER and PCOR provide avenues to strengthen the evidence, close the clinical research gap, and advance health equity. Thank you, Denise. So now um, we've thrown a lot of information in your direction. And we're very, we're very um, eager to answer some of your questions. Please um, type them into the chat, and we will answer them as they, as they pop up. So our first question is from Rachel Hansen. She asks, when you talk about health systems, are you specifically addressing the hospital environment, or does this include community-based care in your analysis? So when we're talking about the health system in terms of health system transformation, we're talking about all of the providers. Um, so that would include uh, healthcare, hospital systems, federally qualified health centers, primary care doctors. You know, it's the entire range of of what we what is the healthcare system in this country. Are there any other questions? So while, while folks have a chance to type in their questions, I wanted to expand a little bit on um, examples of what is patient-centered outcomes research. Um, for, so it is the difference between research that looks at, for example, um, what certain values are on a lab test or something like that, which is what doctors would really want to know, versus how patients are actually feeling and what is their function, you know, what are their functionality. So, for, so one example would be uh, to look at asthma in kids, researchers might be looking at their lung function tests, but a parent might be more interested 
treatment actually help them sleep at night or go to more days of school. So that's an example of why it's so important that, that patient-centered outcomes research continues to be supported and why it's such a great opportunity to be able to dig into kind of the real life, um, the very varied real life situation that people face um, in addressing their, their health care because they're not doing it in a vacuum. And we all know that there are many, many different factors in communities, in home environments, et cetera, that will have um, a real impact on how, you know, how, much a, how a treatment will work or not. Next question. Do you have model language to include health equity frameworks into proposed state level legislation? That is an excellent question. Um, and we have, as you know, as we mentioned, we have uh, a specific agenda uh, that was focusing on very particular issues, uh, 19 for 2019 and beyond. We are very eager to partner with advocates at the state level um, to come up, you know, to, to, to be able to be very responsive to what are the top priorities or issues um, in your state uh, in terms of advancing health equity focuses and transformation. So, you know, in one state, they may be focused a lot on um, improving evidence collection on health care so that it's disaggregated data. So you can see the difference between a Puerto Rican um, asthma rate and a general Latin, Latino asthma rate. Um, other states might be working on something more specifically about how to how to deliver care and want to make and want to try to get community health workers paid for because there's a lot of evidence about how effective they can be in addressing um, barriers to health. So what I would say to you is please reach out to us um, and we are eager to work what makes sense in your particular you know depending on your state's situation, where they're at, their politics, et cetera, to come up with uh, legislative proposals that you could use. Um, Nilda Croach, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this name. We have another question um, on are providers willing to participate and what are the barriers? And I will ask you if you can uh, specify, you mean participate in the research, participate in system transformation. Um, that would um, and so next question, we'll wait for your answer for that. Next question, oh, in the research. Um, well, that really varies. You know, one of, the, one of the issues with research is that it's been historically so driven by academic institutions um, and, you know, not all providers have the infrastructure or the ability to engage in, in research in the way you know, you, that is often required. That said, there's been a lot of work around trying to advance um, uh, community participatory research, um, which is much more focused on trying to get that um, on the ground providers involved in research studies as well as the, their communities. Um, so more work would have to, you know, more work needs to be done to promote that kind of research and to get more uh, people involved and more providers and more researchers involved in this kind of research in particular. Okay, next question. Uh, are you mainly focused on research in underserved ethnic groups or also underserved from an uninsured point of view? Um, so that's an excellent question and one of the things that um, that, that really that is important to distinguish is that our health system transformation work um, generally is separate from the coverage work, right? So getting an insurance card is, continues to be extremely important for Families USA. We continue to work on that in many ways. But this is about how the health system um, is structured and how care is paid for, for once you have what that key to get into the system, right? Because one of the things that we know, and especially true when it comes to health equity, is that there are huge, huge disparities and inequities among people with exactly the same insurance and exactly the same um, market. Um, and so it's digging into what's behind, if you think of an insurance card as the key to open the door to care, this project works on what is behind that door and making sure that what people can get is, in terms of um, their health care, is high quality, culturally competent, and really can make a difference in improving their health outcomes. Okay, next question. 
given that there is so much focus on social determinants of health, is there a research agenda focused on capturing patient perspectives? Um, that's, an, that's a very interesting question, and I think that there, I'm not entirely sure that there is a specific national research agenda for capturing patient perspective, but I do believe that story and even, you know, the more traditional research organizations like the CDC and NIH, as well as, you know, universities and so forth, have been expanding their work in, you know, community participatory research. Uh, and that is really the, the, what is right now the leading um, mechanism for getting more uh, patient input into research. If you're very interested in this issue, one of the things I would recommend is actually uh, PCORI has a bunch of different uh, ways to get involved in as a patient or a caregiver uh, in helping define those research questions. Um, and so, you know, that's one, that's one way to get more involved. I served for three years as, on their Addressing Disparities Advisory Council, and that's, that's one way of getting more involved. But I think on the local level as well, you know, the, uh, opportunities to partner with particular researchers, um, you know, in your local university um, to make sure that their outreach is, is more effective and that, the, and that they are uh, crafting questions that are responsive to what patients need is one way to get more involved. Um, one, one example that we've seen that's been fascinating is work that's been done um, with black churches and the black faith um, community in working, partnering with local universities, um, not only to get more diversity in their research subjects, but also to elicit what are the priorities and the issues that the community wants um, to learn more about. So what are some tangible ways to improve diversity in the physician scientist research workforce? So I think um, what I just said is one covers some of that. Um, but at the end of the day, I, we have to also remember, and this is the reason why we have six domains um, in the, the way we're thinking about health equity and system transformation, is that there is not one single like silver bullet to solving it all. And one of the key issues that we need to grapple with, and that may be a good topic for a future um, webinar, is the fact that we do not currently have either the numbers, distribution, or diversity in uh, in the workforce, um, in the medical workforce, in the healthcare workforce, and I, and, and I think it's very much also true in terms of, you know, the academic medical um, field of the folks who are actually working on, these kind of re on this kind of research. Um, next question. I work for a telemedicine company. Do you partner with companies like mine bringing telemedicine to underserved populations? Um, so we are a policy advocacy organization, so we, we aren't actually involved in providing healthcare services, um, but we can, but one of, one of the things that we do focus on is looking at the different strategies for addressing some of the issues with lack of, um, you know, lack of appropriate workforce and lack of specialists in some areas, et cetera. So tele, we believe that telemedicine is a big, is an important part of the solution. And we are planning um, in the future to, to actually look into some of PCORI's research on telemedicine um, and pull out some of the lessons learned in terms of policy that can support what actually works. So stay tuned for that. Next question, how do, my, how do you get minorities involved when they are mistrusting, especially if they are undocumented? So um, I think those are two, two different questions. And, one question for, um, in terms of getting undocumented involved in research is that, you know, we, that is probably something that uh, would help expand the applicability of research, but I think we also have to be very respectful of where communities are in terms of their own priorities and their own concerns. I think it is a lot to ask of undocumented families right now in, this, in the current um, environment um, to put themselves out there like this in this kind of research. Um, but, you know, I would not be surprised that there are people who are undocumented who have been here for years and, and have found a way to get involved. That said, the issue of how to get trust in communities of color in generally, when there has been so much um, mis, 
you know, misuse, abuse, um, and, you know, lack of transparency with many communities. And, you know, a lot of people know about um, the example that Denise mentioned, but you could look at communities across the country and they're just example after example after example with Native Americans, with Puerto Ricans, with Hispanics of, of research or supposed research being done um, in very unethical ways that, can, that even, you know, worsen their health or, you know, violate community um, standards. So uh, the way to do that really is to make sure you're partnering with people in the community. So the example of working with black churches um, to get involved in research is excellent. You start, you, you, rather than trying to parachute into a community which you may not understand or not have a connection with, um, the way to get this done is to partner with those who already understand and trust the community, and the community trusts them, um, and enter that uh, space with humility and the ability to adapt what you, what you were thinking you were going to study to what actually is needed, um, what the community says is needed. Um, and our report on, um, that we published on, pay, on the uh, connection between equity and um, patient-centered outcomes research in December uh, mentions a few examples of the right way and the wrong way of doing it. Um, so for example, in researching, uh, in doing research in, Native, in a Native American reservation, ensuring that rather than just coming in and you know, expecting people to want to work with you, you actually work with a Native American person who has understanding um, as one of the research assistants. You know, that makes it something that is then more uh, doable and where there's more trust. Okay, great. As we've said before, you know, we are very eager to continue a conversation one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, we just, the question is, why did you just establish the center? Um, I'm not sure if you mean why did it take, you know, why now um, and why not before? Um, I mean, so as we, as I mentioned at the beginning, yeah, why now? Um, so. This is something that Families USA has been working on for a while, to build up our work in the health equity space, um, and in particular in, in finding a way to, to work at that intersection between health equity and health system transformation. I think a lot of, um, and you know, it's been, it's been a process, uh, and part of, the, you know, part of the challenge that we are trying to address with the center is the fact that many healthcare advocates across the country, you know, have been really, really focused for excellent reasons on coverage and defending the Affordable Care Act, et cetera. So there needed to be uh, some time for, for folks to be able to better understand um, how these issues, you know, if, even if you achieve coverage, that there's still a lot of issues to be addressed in terms of equity, and even, even outside of equity, in terms of quality and affordability and so forth. Um, so we're really excited to be able to be at a, at a point now where we have the center. We're very excited to work with all of you, anyone who is interested in learning more about all the different ways um, that you can uh, work on advancing equity. The good thing about having, of, of thinking about this system, system, systematically in terms of the questions of workforce, the questions of evidence, the question of of what are the what, what do we how do we support community based uh, providers, et cetera, is that wherever you are working in the health in the healthcare space, there is probably something that you can do um, to advance equity and system transformation. Um, so we invite you to please learn more about our center. Uh, on the screen, you see the link to uh, the Health Equity Action for Sense Transformation Center at Families USA, and there's a lot of information there. You can also get a copy of um, the, the report that we published in December that talks, that is specifically about evidence for equity. And there, we also invite you, if you want to learn more, um, to sign up for our Health Equity Action for Transformation Network. Um, and that will be uh, a way to ensure that as we develop more more uh, tools and more webinars and more products um, that you will be in the loop and be able to continue to engage with us. Our, the, this, this webinar has been recorded. We will be able to provide 
um, the slides as well as a, as a recording of, of the conversation, and uh, you will be getting an email with all the information once it's available, and you will also be getting a survey about us, uh, about this work, um, and about what you're interested in this work, which will be very helpful to us to help us figure out how we should focus our resources and our energy uh, to better serve you. Thank you very much. One last chance for questions. Okay, thank you everybody. Have a great afternoon, and we really do hope to be hearing from you very soon. Uh, again, we're super excited to work with partners across the country to move this forward. Um, so we hope to hear from you. Have a great afternoon.